we'll talk a little bit about exactly what Accentista does in a couple of minutes, yeah. but briefly <coughs> it's about broadcast content and helping making it more interactive. Yes. Yes. Okay, go with me. Um, <laughs> so we were just after coming through, I suppose, what's one of the biggest content, you know, uh, events of the year, which is the general election. And you know, you're looking at all of the the online media platforms and all the, the different sort of press and media agencies. How do you think they did? How do you think somebody like RT did in terms of making that content <coughs> more accessible to people? And like, what would you do differently? Uh, what I would do differently. Lots of things, but um, in terms of how RT did, I was constantly checking because I'm actually, I live just right over there and I'm in this uh, Dublin Bay South area of voting and um, I w just wanted to know who got in and, and it was, I think it went to the 8th count so we had no seats mm -hmm. up until the 8th count um, and our RT's mobile site was very, very good okay. for finding out um, who had actually got in and when. Okay. Um, but what I would do is obviously have an interactive TV experience really? <laughs> with lots of different, you know, with, that you could pick your constituency and just follow news from there rather than sort of have to sit through all the national and local stuff, which is sometimes really, really entertaining sure. but takes a long time. Okay. Yes. Do you, do you see other, you know, sort of other countries and other media agencies that do it better, have done a better job of it that we could? I haven't really focused on politics per se, but news is definitely an area, live news is definitely an area that we work with a lot. Um, and I think, you know, news at the moment is a very rolling sort of experience um, and it's, it's not personalised, it's not something that you can kind of dip in and out of and, and pick the things that you want to, to actually watch. Okay. Whereas I think that's something that is coming. <laughs> okay, so this, this is an industry that you've been immersed in for, for a long time, so prior yeah. to Accionista as well. And, and to be honest, when, when, when you were first telling me about Accionista, I got super confused with sort of broadcasters and partners and the content and the channels and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So since I, I murdered the introduction as to what Accentista does, do you want to lay out that landscape a little bit? Sure. Um, I'm assuming everybody has watched television at some point in their lives, Can right? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so we all know what the TV is. Um, and there's been a constant innovation through technology for the TV industry for a number of years, um, particularly um, around the set-top box in your living room with the big screen. Um, so you've got things like um, on-demand viewing, live streaming, um, being able to remote record, all those things that you're all familiar with. But in the last couple of years, that has accelerated. And the reason it's accelerated uh, is really because of the pro proliferation, oh, that word came out right, um, of the smart devices that everyone now has. Yeah. And that is, that, that's a huge game changer um, for the, the TV industry. And what that means is that content is suddenly broadcasters had to compete to get all their content on all these different devices and all these different screens. So basically the content moved from the big screen in the living room to all these smaller screens. Um, and where broadcasters are competing with each other now is in innovation. If you're not innovating in television, mm. you won't be around in 10 years, basically. And is, that, is, is, is the focus there all about innovation in delivery? The the format because I know because like you know there's there's been a lot of different sort of you know uh, pro programs terrible word but programs around innovation accelerators focused on different TV formats like you know everybody um, wants to find the next who wants to be a millionaire but you're not talking about just that innovation not just that but it does include it yeah um, but what we're well, where we fit into that picture is that we our technology helps uh, broadcasters create new experiences for those new uh, devices and experiences that are optimized for viewing on those devices. Um, in line with their editorial. So um, it's always better if I give a practical like, example from the, the user experience, the end user experience. So if you're watching a television show and you think of any show that has captions overlaid um, on, on the video. Yeah. Um, so typically like sports, news, uh, shopping, those kind of things. And if you're, say it's a presenter who is calling out Twitter and he's saying, oh, get in touch with us on Twitter, here's our Twitter handle, here's our hashtag, and it's presented on a caption mm -hmm. on the, the first screen, the big screen in the living room, that's fine. But if you're watching that from a mobile first perspective, mm -hmm. and say you're watching it in, in an iPad, yeah. that's kind of a broken experience for two reasons. The first reason is that there's a caption that you're trying to tap and it doesn't work, it's pretty much broken, right? The other reason is that person is telling you to leave the app that you're viewing the video in, yeah. in order to go and go to Twitter, 
remember the hashtag, remember the handle, and then like don't get distracted by the cats and then come back, right? So that's a, bit, a pretty disjointed experience. So with our technology, we can take the captions from the first screen and combine them with the video, overlay them on top of it, so it's an interactive caption that is in sync with the video, um, that when you tap it, it pops up a little dialogue box. Mm. You can put in your tweet. It already has the hashtag and the, at, the handle in there because the A technology. And you can send it, and mm. you're still watching the show. You're still within the experience. So that's an example. Okay. We mentioned news earlier, yeah. so another example would be if everyone's familiar with that ticker that goes across the bottom of live news and it's rolling coverage, and uh, you know there's always something interesting that just just out of your eyes reach, which looks like a vaguely interesting headline that you might want to see. Um, but if you take that in a mobile first environment and you make that into a graphic, and you can use that as a remote to tap through the different various news stories that you actually want to see and build your own video playlist. Mm. That's a much more personalized okay. experience. And, and they're the types of use cases that our technology allows broadcasters to build. Who, who do you think benefits most from, from, from that sort of technology? I mean, who's, who, who are you delivering most value to there in terms of the, the technology? Because you're kind of saying, you know, it's a more immersive experience for the viewer. Hmm. Do, they, do, do they want that? Do they want to be more immersive? So you're kind of saying to the broadcasters, you know, I'm going to increase the amount of eyeballs and the length of time that they're. Our customers are the broadcasters, broadcasters right now, but that, I mean, that's a f that's the first phase of what we're doing. Um, it's also for the, the user experience. We want nice user experiences that aren't sucky for mobile viewers because we also watch on mobile. Yeah. Um, so I think you know it's it's a win-win for both. Um, and really, the race is for eyeballs, as you say, and the way to get them is to create the best experiences for viewers. And if people have really high expectations of technology nowadays, mm. you know, they're used to good technology, they're used to using Gmail, they're used to using Facebook, they're, and it's it's an expectation. This should be the right thing, it shouldn't be a broken experience. The, the companies that you're selling into then, the broadcasters, the cable, the network, all the, you know, those, those wonderful words from, from, from the yeah. agents about television, they're, they're behemoths, right? These are big companies yes. that traditionally have been around, they're, they're, they're there for a very long time. Mm. Are they? So the content, is it, it can be innovative, right? So they can bring in new formats of shows and programming, but are they innovative when it comes to the technology? Is it easy to sell innovative technology to, I don't know, MTV, as an example? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's kind of there's two types of broadcasters, right? There's broadcasters that have been around for a long time, and they're behemoths, but they really know their stuff, and they've been continually innovating for many, many years. Mm. So you know, in order to sell to a customer like that, you have to just show that you understand where their vision is for the future of, of how they want to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, for example, with QVC, who's a, a customer of ours and a big global client, we, we understood how they wanted the future of their company to run. Okay. But also an organization is made up of people, right? So um, people also have their own agendas and objectives. And you can help people sort those things out and make their lives easier in that organization than you're helping the whole organization move forward. That's really the way to tackle those behemoths. If you are, there's a second type of broadcaster, which is like a more like a digital native. Okay. They don't have any of the old uh, technology. They don't have any legacy stuff that they have to mind. They just kind of, okay, we're getting into broadcasting now. What do we need? We need a CDN. We need video. CDN. Need, oh, sorry, content delivery network. <laughs> just for the um, non-broadcast yes, nerds. Yes, sorry. Um, I, I won't say any more three-letter things. Um, and you know, they're they're just getting into the into the business now so they they can do it relatively quickly and easily and that's um, and that's it's kind of a symptom of video being democratized yeah. as a wider societal thing if you look at how many live streaming apps have just popped up in the last year like so many of them right and Facebook is now anytime you go on to wish anyone a happy birthday they're like do you want to record a video with yeah. that <laughs> no <laughs> but maybe yes but that kind of expectation of of, of, and democratization of video means it's no longer the exclusive tool of filmmakers. Yeah. It's the means of communication for anyone who wants to use it. And I think you're just going to see the, the rise and rise and rise of, of mobile video, especially over this coming year. But the more need, um, need for mobile video there is, mm. the more need for interactive experiences there is too. So y you breeze through an awful lot of really interesting stuff Sorry. there, right? So I'm, I'm going to take apart some of those those, those, sure. those last sentences because you just sort of like casually mentioned that QVC were a customer, and that's, that's 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 kind of huge, you know. There's not many Irish startups who have 
landed QVC as a customer. Mm. And what was really interesting about it is you, can, you were able to say, we could tell where QVC's innovation path is going to. Yeah, we understood it. How, we how, could show how, that we could help so, how, what was it about Axonista? What was it about Claire that you know allowed you specifically to specifically Claire? Okay. I mean, everything in Axonista is a team effort, right? Um, and and it's the same. It's kind of the same approach with, with any global leader in who's been innovating for a number and number of years, right? Mm. You just have to really understand a the future of the industry, which we do as a team, and that's something that when we hire is a thing that we look out for. Is this person really interested in the future of, of TV? Mm. You know, if they're not, that's kind of a red flag, right? Um, so understand that and understand how they're going to get there and guide them through it and work with them on those innovation projects. And that's what makes us buzz as a company. Mm. Like we get really excited about doing. And I love like hearing questions from our team like, wouldn't it be awesome if? Yeah. <laughs> or um, imagine we could. And then the next thing, you know, they've gone and done a demo of it. And it's like, oh my God, that's actually doable. Yeah. Can so, we have it next week, please? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've just sold it, so uh, yeah. deliver that. Yeah. So l let's go back then a little bit into, into your own personal past and, and, and you know, get personal to a point, past. personal past, because while, it's, while it is, as you say, a team effort as to whether or not you can determine what QVC's innovation path is, yeah. your personal background contributes an awful lot to that. So what brought you to this big bad world of broadcasting in the first place? I've always liked watching television. Oh, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Anybody else like television that ended up in a broadcast company? Um, <clears throat> many people in broadcast companies like television. And I think it's really important that I have been a fan. I'm still a fan. I'm, you know, looking forward to watching Bones later on, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's that kind of... I really like storytelling in general. Mm. And I think if I can go back to my childhood a little bit... Um, I grew up in a very creative household. So, um, and I, I only really started thinking about this after when I knew I was going to be doing this chat with you and sort of like, well, what, what makes me me? You know, I had a bit of a like soul searching couple of days there. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and, um, and I went back and I just kind of looked at things. And I said, actually, when I look back from here, it's quite, it's quite an obvious path. Okay. Um, and it's, it wasn't a straightforward path by any means. Um, you know, the, but there are commonalities through it that that made me go into uh, television business. Let's say. So um, step one. What, what what was that first step then into the, into? I think you know, just growing TV up in a world. very, oh, growing up in a very creative household. Mm. I think just makes you very open to um, different perspectives on things. Was was it a very entrepreneurial focused, innovative household as well as being yeah. creative? There was a bit of both. So okay. My mother, was, it, she's an artist, so she was always, you know, making paintings and then selling them. So that's a bit of both, right? And my dad, who had a, uh, originally was working in the civil service, had a huge passion for amateur theatre. So he was constantly putting on productions with his production crew. Okay. So we were always involved in some sort of theatre production as a family because it was kind of, okay, how do we, how do we get the show on the road? And I was reading lines with my dad from Sean O'Casey and Bertolt Brecht and all sorts of plays um, when I was, you know, seven or eight years old. Okay. Um, and I, I, I was involved in many of their productions as well. If they ever needed a child, you know, it was either me and my brother were available. You know, I played Malter and Clown the Stars when I was 11. Yeah. And I was still going to school. Like, this was like just part of my life. So I kind of, you know, loved the sense of creating something from nothing. Or really, you know, just okay. Let's make let's make a play. You're born for the stage. <laughs> you don't need me here at all. You can just stand here and just talk. <laughs> no, I mean no. But like, there's there's just a, that kind of love of, of creativity. I think and entrepreneurialism really go quite closely together. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's something that's carried with me throughout my career. And at that stage, when you were sort of there was you know aware of being involved in enterprises and putting on amateur dramatics is as much as enterprise as starting a business, right? Yeah. You've got resources, you've got project plans, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. would, would you have had somebody who was successful, someone that you would have looked at, a grown-up, and said, that's a successful person, I, I want to be like that? Ooh. Do you want to think on that one? I'll come back to you. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I mean, hmm. Mull on it. Mull on it for a minute. I will mull on that one, yeah. Um, so, given 
the amateur dramatics yes. and the artistic you know, endeavours in the house, it's, it's a complete shock that you ended up in rock school, right? <laughs> There's also a musical side to my family, mm. but, um, and more so uh, my uncle, who's a, a traditional mus uh, musician, in, he was in a band called Alton for a number of years, oh, yeah. yeah, fairly well-known Irish uh, trad band, and so I spent a lot of summers in fiddle school in uh, Donegal, um, and I just really loved the power of live music. It's an amazing thing to be involved in, especially when you're playing, because you're collaborating with somebody and creating something out of nothing. Mm. Um, and it's it's a really um, it's a really joyful experience, and it, it, it's just something that's magic, mm. right? And I think you know that was something that uh, I wanted to explore in more detail, and I also wanted to explore the Irish music business as well. And and myself and my friend, my good friend Jill, who's here tonight. Um, we're in a band together and we, we, you know, we sang and played guitars and sometimes I played a fiddle. And we decided to try out rock school, <laughs> which was in its second year. So, so, so to go back then to the question about mm. people that you saw as being successful, did you see your uncle and his success at Alton and go... Oh yeah. All right, okay, well, yeah. that was easy. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask more, more, more about success. Okay, so I joined rock school. What was that? Yeah. Like? Just, um, it was great and it was crazy at the same time. And I think you when know, things are great and crazy, it's always fun, right? <laughs> so um, there was a lot about like the music business. The people who were running the course were very much, um, had been musicians themselves or were still musicians and wanted to create an environment, kind of like an accelerator really, mm. for new musicians to flourish and understand the business and, and maybe learn some things that they didn't know about themselves when mm. they were getting into it originally. But like, you know, the year ahead of us, uh, there was Damien Dempsey, Mundy, like these are pretty, well-known name, so they, there's a lot of people who actually went on to pursue uh, music careers afterwards. Um, but uh, I think I can make this claim, there's probably three people in this room definitely who have been to rock school, because one of them works in our company as well. <laughs> Jean's the other one? I didn't know. Jill's the other one, yeah. So, um, so there's, I think we're the only company with two, the only technology company with two rock school alumni, isn't it? What did, what did, uh, other, like, so you knew how to be a musician before you went in, yes. and you, you talked about learning about the, the industry, I guess, in, mm. in some sense. Management and production and all that kind of stuff. What about yourself? What did you learn about yourself in that year? In that year? We're going back a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> what did I learn about myself? I learned that, you know, that I enjoyed music yeah. and, I learned, and that I enjoyed collaboration. Did, I you, think did, did you still want to be that, you know, the, that rock star, like famous like your uncle when you came out at the end of the year? I mean, I always liked the stage. I always liked performing, okay. for sure. Yeah. Um, but and, and yeah, you have to think big. I think that's another thing that it teaches you to think big, okay. um, which is something we should come back to later on. <laughs> um, but you know, after that, I I meant to do a degree in communications, and then I started it, but I felt like a fish out of water, and I I dropped out of college. So, you know, I got into the working life probably a little bit earlier than I would have. Okay because rock school was just a year at that yeah. point. Um, and then I started working in, uh, with business owners, actually, in startups. Uh, so uh, companies like um, Trinity Technology Group, which uh, went on to become Ebion, which was one of the biggest mm -hmm. Irish kind of dot-com companies at the time. And I worked in Nebula as well, which is where I met co-founder Dara. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the founders of that company. And, um, you know, it kind of got to, and I was working in sort of operational roles, okay. but which gave me a very broad sense of how companies are run. Mm -hmm. And I think you learn a lot when you when you're able to see that from sort of a very sort of helicopter view, if you will, of of how a whole company is run. You learn a lot about um, the different aspects of it, what needs to be done, and I think the the building blocks of how to put a company together. I became more apparent. So you know, it, it's a good grounding for sure. You know, mm. being in that operational role, and you get to see, you know, the the, the processes and understand the resources, and, and 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 be able to deliver a more efficient operation. But mm. you're not the person who holds the vision for the company, and you can't you can't change the course of that vision. No. So at what point did you say, I have a vision, and 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 I want to do this for myself rather than just you know, make make somebody else's vision more efficient. Well, at that point, you know, I was still quite young, <laughs> and I traveled around the world, and I, you know, went and I, I worked in Sydney for a, 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 you know, probably about half a year, 
on the Olympic Games, like building the actual stadiums and stuff. I worked for a project management company there and I mm. loved that company culture. Mm. They had a beer fridge that was huge. <laughs> there was like, you could get like a massage at any time of the day because, you know, the first person to email massage got one. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> there was, but I loved that kind of Sydney vibe and culture and, and I really learned a lot about how, I think working in a different country is a really good education too. Sure. Um, but I still wanted to progress myself in learning and I, so you know although I didn't go, officially go to college I've been to college many many times um, and I, I, want, I was interested in project management when I was working in, um, in uh, Ebion mm. so I went to study project management at night okay. and I had started working in Satanta Media at that point as well so I wanted to bring that into Satanta Media. So what was Satanta Media doing? So because this is this is starting to move into the yeah. Now we were still. It was a technology company. It was um, hadn't set up the television channel yet. Okay. So what we were doing was uh, creating um, text updates for Vodafone for Vodafone customers around sports. So there was a okay. bunch of journalists sitting in a room together, um, creating content, online content around sports. Okay. And it was a really young, buzzy place to be and. You know, when, when I heard they were getting into television, um, I really wanted to be part of that project. So I said, can I, can I get into this? Yeah. And they said yes, because they were that kind of open company. They needed people to, to, to run it. And they brought in all these experts from um, RTE. Like, so people who, like the CEO of uh, Satanta <coughs> Ireland was a guy called uh, Niall Cogley, mm -hmm. who works in TV3 now, but had been the head of sport in RTE before he came to Satanta. Yeah and he brought it to his colleagues over as well. And there were some of the people who had actually worked on the start of television in Ireland. So they, they were telling us these amazing stories about how they used to do things, and we learned so much from them. And I think that kind of gave me the love for that industry. Okay. And having worked in the online industry, the, I, I really wanted to kind of combine those in some way, because I, I, I could see that that was the way that, that everything would eventually go you know, that the web and that mobile and TV would come together. But, but that, that, that's a very sort of bland statement to say, kind of say, I could see. What, what, hmm. what, 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 were you, what were you thinking about at that time? Who were you looking at in terms of other companies or competitors and, and, and that, that led you to say, I think this is the way it's going to go? I was actually looking at contracts. Okay. <laughs> I was looking at, because my job in Satanta evolved then into um, Involved in the initial setup of it, and like we did all sorts of crazy stuff, <laughs> um, you know, and everyone had to because there were only so many of us, and we just, it was really startup five, and it was great, <laughs> but it allowed you to like learn about all the different uh, types of broadcasting and different elements to it. Um, but uh, you mentioned contracts that you were able contracts. to see contracts. Yeah. So one of the things I was doing was buying programs. Right, to put onto air on TV and then putting the schedule together. So my okay. job was to create something around live sports. So it was a, a viewer journey, right, yes. that I was creating, and I was very proud of it. Every week I was like, oh, yes, look at this <laughs> thing that I've created. It's amazing. Um, and then it would all get moved around because live events get cancelled yeah. and moved, and you know, people don't want to play sport on different nights. And there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in the background that you don't even know. But it's um, but looking at contracts, they started to evolve. <coughs> Different things started to appear in them. So you had, where it was just like television rights. Then it kind of became broadband. Then there was like VOD started creeping okay. in there. So all these terms started coming in and I was like, okay, this is definitely moving. Okay. This is definitely moving in a very interesting way towards mobile. And what was your role at that point in the time to media? Or uh, into the, it, was, it was the channel TV, at that yeah. stage, it was TV at that stage. Yeah, I was a program manager there. And you know, did you consider taking this this realization, <coughs> this awareness of where the market trend was going, and, and just bringing it to the existing team in, 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 in the TV station and saying, "Hey, I've got an idea," because you didn't. You, you, no. You know, so, <laughs> well, what, was, so what, what was what was that decision time like for you? Um, I mean, it, we continued. I continued to work there. Yeah. Like we, you know, I was there for a number of years, um, and you know, we we also set up a news channel in the UK, and I was part of that team that ran that as well. So. Uh, and it was a sports news channel. It was a really interesting experience. So I think, you know, for me, we had, just sometimes, you know, you feel it's time to go, right? From a, from a job. And I think we had done the whole UK thing, Ireland, and I, I kind of thought, you know, this is the point that I, I don't want to be, um, I want to kind of investigate 
these hunches that I have. Yeah. Um, and I, I always wanted to kind of do something myself as well. And I said, you know, why don't I do it? Like. So go back then to my early question about yeah. successful people. At that point, when you were thinking, I think I'd like to build something myself. I yeah. think I have, you know, garnered enough information from 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 market trends and understanding, following yeah. the money and the contracts. Mm. Did you look around and say, I want to be successful like that person? They went out on their own and did something. Well, I, I knew a lot of those people okay. because I worked with them in the digital agencies in in, in, in Nebula in um, kind of people doing this for themselves and actually, you know, being on their third startup or that kind of thing. Okay. So it wasn't at that point in my life. It wasn't a very foreign notion to me because okay. I'd seen other people do it. And, and lots of Irish entrepreneurs, um, but people behind those companies that I've worked in. Okay. And how much of it was, I want to build something for myself, to see if I can do it to test the hunch, and how much of it was, I want billions and billions of dollars, and I think this is a good way of doing it? I don't think, if, if you're focused on the money then, like, you know, like, it's great to be focused on money because you need money, right, to run things. But I think if, you, if that's all you care about, you, what, what, what legacy are you leaving in the world, okay. you know? I mean, it has to be about something bigger than that and something much bigger picture than just I would like to get rich because if, if you go into the business with this mindset of I think it's a get rich quick thing it's not it'll take you a long long time before you even I mean you, you'll have to fund it yourself for a while and then you have to be prepared to bootstrap and know how to bootstrap and get to, used to that way of living and then you have to build a team and attract the right team and have the money in place for that and then you have to build customer and partner relationships and all that stuff and that is bootstrapping for a few years so if it's a get rich quick thing don't set up by yourself <laughs> so that, and that, that that's the genesis then of Axinista right there is that you you decided that you would do something and you you bootstrap them oh, really it was like any good Irish startup it, it starts at a pub a conversation <laughs> in the pub um, and I I had this kind of hunch going and I met uh, Dara f for a pint and uh, he was on his third startup, actually, um, and he had he he was doing uh, services in enterprise and mobile software, but he really wanted to get into product. Okay. And I was working at Tanta, and I was you know seeing the market shift, and I really wanted to do something with mobile and TV. So we talked about it over a few points and decided it was a good idea, and that was the the start of Axinista, the genesis of it. Really. Okay. So yeah. you didn't immediately go and build a product though. Well, we started to, yeah. Okay. We just really, it was very, we were earlier than the market, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, we also had a couple of customers very early on as okay. well. And, and that was a really good way of finding out product market fit and also funding the business as you grow, right? So that was, that was kind of what we did at the very, very start. We did some early experiments with um, companion apps and just with prototyping for different companies and figuring things out and seeing what worked and what didn't work and what people wanted and where their pain points were. Mm. And at that point did you consider taking traditional steps or you know in the sort of the venture capital type traditional model? Did you go out and talk to angels? Did you explore accelerator programs? We did an accelerator with um, and that was actually where I met Jean. <laughs> so you know accelerators are brilliant. You always meet amazing people in accelerators and you'll, you'll have that shared experience with them that you'll carry for the rest of your life, right? Um, but Initially, we were so ahead of what was happening in, in the market, and it seemed to be moving so slowly <laughs> that it didn't seem the right time to bring it to VC, right? Okay. Because you, you need to get the right timing right for those relationships. But what we did was we said, well, let's, let's build this. Let's figure it out. Let's go to an accelerator and understand and, and we'll work through all these things. And um, after the Propel program finished, we... Um, I think I did another one called Going for Growth, mm -hmm. which I'm also an ambassador for yeah. as well. And uh, that was a really good uh, sort of roundtable um, discussion with a lead mentor every month on, on, on working through different issues with different people from lots of different, um, with different women. It's a, it's a female entrepreneurship program um, from lots of different walks of life that yeah. you could be PR company, design agency, television network, you know, lots of different things. Um, but. Um, then we started to really kind of gain traction and that's when we did the, the HPSU fund. So we went there um, and that enabled us to gain the customers that we have now and also to build out the product and grow the team. Um, so we did something in 2013 called Showpal, mm -hmm. TV3, which was um, a completely synced uh, companion app to their primetime schedule. So lots of different experiences for different shows. 
going from live sport through to fashion through to current affairs so it really kind of opened up what's the possibilities of this experience for everybody and they're they are a great partner for us to work with we've been working with them for a long time go back to the HPSU thing does everyone mm. know what HPSU is it's the, the high potential startup it's the matched seed fund from Enterprise Ireland what was that like as an experience I, I know Dara had been through a couple of startups so you I really looked out getting a, a co-founder who had had three startups before yeah how, how did you? How, I know he's sitting here in the audience. Yes. But put your hands across your ears. How did you? How did you value him and kind of go? Is this the right guy to trust my dream with? Sounds like he's proposing. <laughs> or you're proposing. It's Feb 2019. You could propose now. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, he just. I just had worked with him before. Yeah. So I'd seen him build teams. I'd seen him knew, understand his process. Knew him very well. Um, so. And I could see how passionate he was about doing, building another team and, and building a product. And I really wanted to, you know, it's having somebody who's had that much technical experience. My, my domain knowledge and his technical experience were very good and strong skill set um, in the eyes of investors and also to, to form a company from. So not, not everyone gets the luxury of having worked with you know, no. an experienced technology <laughs> co-founder in, in the past and develop a relationship. They do not. You work with a lot of early stage teams through the black box going for growth, but mm -hmm. next. What would your advice be to someone who is at a super early stage and is struggling to find a co-founder? What, 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 what are you looking out for there in terms of fit? Fit is Just the important right, word. Yeah, part, okay. what <laughs> you hit like? the nail on the head. Someone with um, complementary skill set that knows about the gaps in your knowledge, but um, who also sh has a, a, a shared set of common values, because you're, what you're doing when you're finding a co-founder is actually founding a culture, mm -hmm. and that culture will be driven toward like through your business as you grow it along, as that business develops. That's the culture. That's the the thing that will make it what it is. Yeah. Um, so it has to be a really good fit, but definitely someone with complementary skill sets. If you've both got the same skill sets, you're not going to you're not going to move as fast, mm. um, and you're also not going to stack up as well in terms of people looking at you as an investment option or getting involved, unless you no, really know where your knowledge gaps are. So when you say values and, and the value fit, mm. you talk about you know the, the cultural and, and, and what you want to build. What about ambition? Is that an important? Yeah, you have point. to be on the same page. You also have to share a common vision as well and understand each other's vision and, and, and be willing to compromise on a little bit to get it towards a common vision. Mm. You know, um, I think that's very important. And you've looked at so far? I've been very lucky. <laughs> but I think, you know, when I see somebody and they're trying to find something, they don't have a technical co-founder, I kind of get a bit worried. Because that was never a question for me. I was never questioned on that because obviously I had Dara. But I, I do see people kind of try and prove ideas but not have that expertise and I think it's re if you're in a technology company you have to have a technical co-founder it's so important really really important so yourself and Dara locked in and synced in on vision and all the bits and pieces you started yeah. building the product and obviously after the seed round you started building out the team so that you could deliver projects you know in terms of yeah. the, the QVC show pile or the uh, TV3 show pile that mm. you mentioned um, that was the first um, Thing that we built on our product. What, 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 what's it like building out that team? And, 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 and who, who Again, I looked out having a great technical co-founder who knew how to build teams, you know. Um, but I think we also, during the HPSU, and you know, fundraising is a lot like hiring in a way. You know, you have to, again, it's about fit, right? Mm. So we were very careful about the people that we brought into our small team as advisors and investors and, and we made sure that they filled gaps in our knowledge that we didn't know. Okay. So, uh, you know, s product was something that was new to us. So we needed somebody with a, a SaaS background, sorry, just waving at Jean. <laughs> um, we needed somebody with, who knew about the business models that we could do with, with product and, and, and we have that person. And, and we also needed to get deeper into the broadcast industry. So we have another person who's, uh, who runs a production company, an international one. So, and, and those people come with contacts as well, and they can open doors that you can't. And it's okay. very, very important to get that mix. You know, it's, it's not about the money, it's about, it's about the people and how they can help you. And also how you can make them feel part of your team. 
they have to understand your vision, vision and share it with you and believe in it too and believe in you believe that you can go all the way with it mm. I think that's that's really important too what happens when it goes wrong and did, did, did you make mistakes along of course I made mistakes make mistakes like you know this I think people are hesitant to talk about mistakes <laughs> but mistakes if you make them that's fine as long as you learn from them, mm. you know and and what you what you learn from when you make mistakes or when you fail is you have data that says this doesn't work this approach doesn't work let's not do that again um, but as long as you know what those mistakes are and don't keep making the same one I think so that's fine does, does, would you typify the mistakes that you've made around product and channel or around team or have you done all three <laughs> probably a little bit on everything right um, do you have to fire anybody <clears throat> oh my god that's a very direct question <laughs> yes what was that like um, you know, it's not fun. Yeah. Uh, people are people and people are human and they have emotions and you need to... And it, it's not about... It's not about them being bad, right? It's about them not being a fit. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to ensure that the people that you bring onto your team are the right fit for your team. And if it's not the right fit for your team, then it, you're not doing them a service either. You're doing them a disservice having them there. You know? I, 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 lo losing somebody in a team when you're such a small team, if it's mm. you know at a critical point when you're you're delivering a product into a big first customer, that can be fatal. How how did you how did you? I mean, it's 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 as much about the people who get left behind in the team as the the person who's going. How did you manage that then? With the We've been very lucky with our engineering team. Okay. In that they, that that has been a team that's been solid and been together for a long time and okay. know each other really well. So we have a product team. We have a team that does configuration and, and um, on that product. We do we have a mobile services team as well because. We're really having to show the industry the way forward by building these these apps that we serve, um, and we have a creative team too. So it's it, there's kind of three teams there: so yeah. it's creative, product, and services, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> but the engineering team is, is is has been a fantastic team. Where where we've actually had the issues with hiring, we're on the <coughs> the operational <coughs> side. Okay, and it was because we weren't really ready for that person to come on board and we, we didn't have the groundwork done in order for them to do their job yeah. properly and I think that's a really you think that and I've heard this mistake happen a lot in different in different uh, um, companies where you get to a certain point you think yes now I need a director of sales but you bring that person on and you know you know why aren't you selling <laughs> like, well you know what what is this yeah. you know so this you have to communicate what you have to that person, they need, they need to understand what kind of environment they're getting themselves into as well. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's it's really about communication and fit. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you do hear that a lot with scaling mm. teams that the, the sales director tends to be the one that people stumble on first because it's what it's taking what you think your company does yeah. and trying to get somebody else to tell the world about it. Yeah. And, and that, that that can break down very quickly. Yeah. So I think you need to kind of hire at the last minute for those type of roles that you have all the preparation done. And they go, okay, bring that person on there. Okay. Yeah. So you talked earlier on about thinking big from day one, thinking mm. big from the start. What, 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 tell, tell us about where you are at the moment with that word. Thinking what, big. Thinking big, yeah. Wow. It's something that really came home to Reese when we went to Black Box last year. We were there one year ago. Tell us about Black Box. Um, Black Box is an accelerator in uh, Silicon Valley, and it's really um, awesome. <laughs> to use the Silicon Valley word. Um, it's a fantastic experience. We were very, very lucky to be selected to go on it last year with 15 other um, companies from around the world. And basically, you have 15 companies. This, I think it was funded by uh, Google for Entrepreneurs as well. Um, 15 companies in a B&B for two weeks and you bring mentors and other experts in and they tell you all these amazing things, but you also get to chat over dinner and, mm. and breakfast and lunch you get to know each other really really well what's the commonality between the 15 is it you know their stage okay yeah so we were kind of slightly later stage and everyone that had been coming from different countries was just like had just done amazing stuff we were blown away by the people we were in the room with it was like this is an honor to be here mm. these are amazing people they've all done amazing things in their countries but what was really interesting about it was that the viewpoints that different cultures had um, on different problems that companies had within the team you know it was like have you thought about doing this it's like well no I had thought about yeah. doing that but that sounds like a bloody good idea yeah. <laughs> so um
So there was a lot of learning from the fellow participants as much as there was from all the great mentors that they brought in and they brought in super mentors. And there was a big pitch at the end as there always is with these um, accelerators. So it was it's just such a, a vibrant energy about Silicon Valley. You just haven't come back from there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, like everybody wants to help you and, and everyone has some kind of startup that they're working on as well, right? Yeah. From your Uber driver to the postman <laughs> um, in Palo Alto, it's like, you know, this is my idea, and how can I help you? And what, like, and, and they really um, have this focus of what's the best that that can be, what's the biggest it can be, and what's your north star. Whereas I think sometimes in Ireland we might think a little bit too small. We might, well, we try and make it work here, and then maybe we'll make it work here, which is also like a good way of, you know, practically doing things. But if you don't kind of go, okay, how is this the biggest it can be? What's that look like? Then you're never really going to get there. How do you how do you translate that then into the team back home? Yeah. Like, how do you, how, like how do you transform North Star into it's Tuesday and we just fired the director of sales? And I know that that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't the pathway, right? But but you know how, how do you, how do you take that 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 <clears throat> being inspired by the vision and the the energy and then bring it back down to okay that translates into strategy and tactics because you know not every, not the whole team went out there. So how do you how do you you got to be that? able to communicate your vision to your team, you know and. And that it can be about, we want to build the future of television. Now, who doesn't want to build the future of television? Everyone on our team does. <laughs> and they're all doing it. And they've done it with, like, so far with some pretty high profile things. We need to provide that environment for them to be able to do that. And, and that's what makes them happy. That's what makes them tick. I think, um, you know... How, how do you introduce yourself to people when you say, I'm the, do you say I'm the CEO of Accionista? Yes. What do you, what do you hope that they'll understand from that? Do you hope that they'll say, this is the vision girl, you know, and, and, and you know, she's the well, one that inspires the team? Or I'm the industry person. So I, I speak a lot at industry events and I speak about um, audience engagement and, you know, connected screens and improving discovery and content and lots of these things um, that are very um, important themes to the TV industry. So that's where I appear, you know, that's that's largely. And I also get involved in a lot of startup stuff, as you know. Yeah. So. That's who I am. So you're in your background, though, in, the, in sort of the, the, the formative years when you were joining, the, you know, Nebula and um, Evian, mm. um, operations was your thing. Now, and now you're sort of like the figurehead, the visionary, the industry person. Operations is still my thing. Right, I was going to ask that. Right? So how, <laughs> how, how do you split your time? And how, how, at some point, you are not efficient if you're focusing on the efficiencies of the yeah. running and you're trying to speak at conferences or be here, right? Actually, most of the team is here. Who's writing code right now? No, no, there's only a couple of people here actually. Joe Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Just find really good people who um, share a set of common values, um, and those common values. And I think it's it's actually a really good way of figuring out if you don't know what your what your values are as a company and you're a startup and you're only getting into it, or you have an established team but you're not really sure. It's something you really really need to understand. What are the qualities of our people that are amazing, mm. and how do they stand out? And they're all amazing, but the things that they all have in common is they're all curious, super creative, really hardworking, and they think about things and they like to learn. Mm. And I think that's our culture. It's a very R and D culture. Mm. We actually have a screening room, a lab upstairs in our mm. office where it actually says "and lab." <laughs> so. And, and we have lab coats, we have lab days. <laughs> we can put on our lab coats and we can go and do lab projects. And there are things from the roadmap that people are like, I really want to figure that out. Yeah. If you see somebody in the office with a lab coat on, they're doing some hardcore thinking right there. I'm going to ask one more question before we go out and do some, some, some Q&A. Yeah. How, how do you benchmark yourself then? You know, how, how, how do you, because that's, that's what we're trying to get at in terms of like, balancing the CEO who is the visionary and the industry mm. person with the person who's also the operations but how do you at some stage say maybe I'm not the best person to be doing this role yeah you know, who watches the watcher I guess is the question interesting right? as good as um, <laughs> yes I like that um, well I, I work with a lot of partners okay to uh, do things quicker than I can do them myself okay so I outsource a lot of functions so pure I have a PR company yeah um, and they're amazing Are they here? <laughs> no, <laughs> they're in London <laughs> They're based in London they, they do TV technology stuff And we have a big press launch with them In the week after next Which is cool okay. um, But uh, legal team may outsource that too. Yeah. Uh, You know, bookkeeping I've done that job myself so I understand it But I outsource that yeah. in a way 
But all these people are still members of our extended team. They're service providers, though. You they know, and if you, if you tell them to do something and you pay them, yeah, they're not going to say, "Claire, that's a terrible idea." So, no. who 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 do you talk to that says, "Claire, that's a terrible idea"? I have a board of advisors, okay, um, and they're all uh, from from investors, but also other advisors as well. So we have people in the industry um, who can give us feedback on things, and we we and people who are also are running other startups who can give us feedback okay. on ideas as well. So, you know, I love collaboration, as you probably guessed throughout this conversation. It's something that I really like. And I think that, you know, running ideas past as many people as possible, you kind of get a feel for what, what's the right thing to do. Okay. So I'm going to go and get questions. So we get the, the, the mics ready. Um, I'm sorry that I'm oh. turned this way the whole time, but this is the way the mic works. We'll, we'll just turn <laughs> and look at them here now. Um, so to, to maybe get your creative Juicers going, not yours. You're fine. What is that? With the uh, with, with Q and A, <laughs> I've got loads of swag from Silicon Valley in the conference last week, right? So it's uh, ask a question, get a T-shirt. They're all medium, uh, and there's a hoodie at the bottom. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, they're all they're all they're all medium. There's a hoodie at the bottom. There's for one large. Is there one large? Can I ask a question for a T-shirt, David? Where, where's, who wears that? For me. Oh yeah, go on. Shoot. Can I have a T-shirt? Oh. <laughs> Well done, you got the t-shirt first. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the question, John. Um, so you said you love collaboration and, uh, and working with people, and I think that's really important. So my question is, how do you sort of get yourself in a situation where you can meet people to collaborate with, or even, um, even just to chat with about ideas and things well. like that? Because I find it quite difficult, for example, to to go out and, and meet these people, do you know what I mean? So you, you should come to more startup grind events. That's, <laughs> that's that, I idea. think that's a, this is a good starting point, right? So there's lots of people here that you can talk to. And let's everyone introduce yourself to him <laughs> afterwards, because he does This is John, our, our newest volunteer. Say hi, John. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, John. <laughs> so at least five people need to go up to John and introduce themselves. What do you do? Well, I travel a lot and I go to a lot of conferences. <laughs> And I think that's a really good opportunity to meet people, especially if you're selling to them. It's a, it's a great place to meet them <coughs> because they're out of their office and they're feeling, you know, they're enjoying themselves. It's a good place to get them. Questions? Shauna? Catch. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you're mentioning your team members yes. and the importance of learning yeah. and curiosity and that's what you're looking for. But how do you know you find them when you first meet them? Like you don't uh, know the when you first process, meet them. Does that work? Or do you have set questions or? There's always a things? getting to know you period, right? You know that, and it it has to be a fit for you, and it has to be a fit for them, and you just have to measure that every couple of weeks and have a chat and say, is this, you know, what's going well, what's not going well, and and that's how you get to know that is right. And it's the only way to benchmark it is to really have that chat and have it often. <coughs> Do you ever get a good feeling at the start and then it replicates throughout? Or, because I, I know in kind of an interview process, it's very difficult to get personality and culture fit. So do you kind of go with your gut initially and then see if it falls through? I have to, like, you have to weigh up a lot of different things. And look, interviews kind of suck for anyone who's actually been the interviewee. Um, and it's a very small amount of time to get to know anybody. And you have to look at them on paper, you have to look at them in person. You, you can also kind of just see how they take from by asking them questions about situations that you know that job or the role that you're looking for will need to know. So you can come up with little tests and just see how they react to different things. And it's not, there's no right or wrong in it. There's all it's just about is this the right person for this role? Thank That's you. it. You're welcome. Question here. Do you want to catch this first? Sure, go ahead. I hope I get it to you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Hi, uh, <laughs> Hello. Um, in the in the evolution of your company as it grew from founders to HP SU to I, I don't know if there was uh, venture capital involved at the end, but no. was there specific pain points or pressures that that you can remember that caused you to move from one stage to the next to the next, or was it just like like uh, was mentioned before a gut feeling that now we need to grow to exercise employees or. Um, complete such and such projects in order to be able to get to the next step. Is there something well, triggers to come to mind? Yeah, you want, first of all, and you want to prove that. You want to prove it locally and then you want to try and prove it internationally and make sure that what you've replicated, what you've done here can replicate globally as well. 
and, and there's stages along the way where you go okay we've done that now let's let's level up and do this and a lot of it is driven by what the market needs as well so you have to pay attention to that and just constantly be on the look out for the future trends of the market. I mean, one of the things that we do as a team is we, we actually publish a weekly newsletter called Rerun. It's turning one next week. Um, and it's all about the future of TV and VR and all that kind of stuff. And that just keeps everybody on track for what's actually the future of the industry. And, and that I think is a really powerful tool for us to all know where we're going and what, where the industry is going. Okay, thank you. Can I have a quick slight follow on question yeah. to that? You will get a chance. There's more t-shirts. Um, There's like... Two t-shirts and a hoodie left. <laughs> but we can have more questions. Um, just on that about sort of like, you know, buy, getting people's buy-in to say we're mm. part of this vision, we're part of the future of interactive TV. A lot of companies are saying interesting things like that, right? So Facebook are doing amazing things with video. And, and yeah. you know, there's, there's heaps of companies that, that, that are doing similar stuff. How do you approach compensation for those companies to reward them for choosing you and Dara? Compensation for those companies for cash, or, 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 or you know, like what, for, 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 the, for the, the employees that are joining, how do you, how do you how do you pay? How well, do we pay people? Well, I know you pay them with <laughs> money, right? But I'm saying there's there's plenty of other companies out there yeah. who are saying something similar. We're the future of interactive TV. How how, right. how, well, how do you reward compensation? By allowing them to, you know, enabling them to work on projects that are award-winning, globally recognised, get kudos from press. Um, you know that, but also giving them a little piece of the pie. We have an ESOP in place as well, okay. um, and and just generally providing them with an environment that they enjoy working in. Okay. I think that's that's it. That's all we can do. Yeah. You know, and you're and playing to your strengths, sorry. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Gentleman here in front. Oh, you got a mic already. So uh, you said that um, you want a sales director at the end of the evolution of. Uh, Sona, but it was said that you so would like to change things of your activity in the past. So, if you could, would you have anticipated uh, having a sales director, so have a more structured approach to sales, or not? Now, I never mentioned a sales director. I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I didn't, so I, I'm not sure. Do you, do you have that function now? I, I actually do a lot of the sales myself. Okay. And so does Dara, we share it. Okay. Um, we do have advisors in enterprise sales, uh, two in particular, who would come in and you know, have taught me loads and loads of stuff about how to, how to win enterprise customers. And so that kind of thing. It's, a, it's a good question, and maybe I misled, so maybe I'll just, just tweak it slightly and say, mm. at some point, you want to move away from the co-founders being involved. And oh, being yeah, that, that's absolutely. It. So what, what conditions will need to be there in, for yeah. Axinis to, to take on somebody in that role? Right, so we, we want to accelerate our plans this year, as you correctly identified at the start of the session. And in order to do that, we're going to look for um, the right funding partner to lead that round, to lead the Series A. Um, we're fully funded for this year, um, as it happens. But And these things do take time. And they take time to get the right partner in place, and I think they should. Um, and at that point, and the point that the industry is right, we'll be bringing on extra people. Okay. Yes. And next question. Uh, <laughs> it's here. So, can you share a little bit, you know, about the tipping point, you know, when you change from being an, uh, you know, employee into really starting the startup, mm. you know, because it involves, you know, a lot of risks, I, I, I believe, yeah? It, yeah, and it could, you know, you know, it could happen, it could not happen after some time. So the question is, what, how do you, you know, really manage the risk on one side? And on the other side, you know, what about the costs? So you have to rent to pay, you know, you have, you know, and what is the amount of time which you basically, you know, from the time you decide that you would like to start with a startup, you really get, you know, the notion of, uh, I would like to leave the company, leave the, you know, the security of being an employee into being into a, within the startup. We have to be prepared to take risk and you have to um, be prepared for it not to work out. And you, you have to kind of consider that as a possibility um, and make sure that you're not left stranded if it does. You know, you have to protect yourself and kind of have a bit of cash in the bank so that that you can live on. I mean, no startup founder has a big salary. <laughs> that doesn't, you know, especially not at the start. But you also have to make sure that you, you are eating and healthy, you know, healthy and being able to pay your own bills. Um, but 
Um, and then, you know, you just, bef you could just, when you start getting up and running, really budget these things and figure out, well, how much is this going to actually cost to run and can we do it? And, and let's put a plan together. And it's really about creating that initial business plan that can just be a spreadsheet, really, just to see how can we get this off the ground and what are the factors that need to happen. You just have to think about all those things um, and weigh up the risk. <laughs> But if you're not, if, if you're outside your comfort zone, I think that's always a good sign that you're living, you know, that you're alive. So basically this involves, uh, you know, kind of a budget, what you have on your bank account, which you invest in the first months. I think I started Axinista with like five grand. <laughs> Did someone tell you that was a good idea? <laughs> no, I'm actually curious, right? I'm asking that because like, you know, I, you know, I see an awful lot of startup business plans, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I know that 99% of, of them are bullshit. Yeah. So at some point, somebody, <laughs> so and, and somebody, <laughs> that's true, right? And then like, at some point, somebody external must have said, oh, that's, you know, possibly less bullshit than most of the ones that we see. You know, maybe five grand is enough for you to get going. I think you can do a lot of things now with the internet, especially. I remember working in an office without an internet <laughs> connection. So I'm going back a long time. But, you know, you can, you can kind of do things from home for the start. You can bootstrap really for a long time before you, get you have to outlay and see significant costs I mean and you can come up with a proposal about something you can show to people in depth that illustrates your vision and the things that you want to prove along the way before you outlay any significant costs I think it's you know it's, it's quite easy with the with the availability of technology to do that now Thank Emily. You. hello hi, hi Emily um, can I ask and you can answer both or I mean, whatever order you want. You're still only getting one, one t-shirt, right? <laughs> <laughs> two questions doesn't give you two okay. t-shirts. Your darkest hour and the best bits, the best and worst. You can have them at like any time of day at the same time. <laughs> 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 well, so far you, you were a startup and now you're getting to be a stayed up. Um, yeah. But was there any point where you just wanted to throw in the towel? Where was it your darkest moment? And then, you know, what was your best bit, your highest achievement so far? Do you like the stays up? Stays up is good, isn't it? Yeah, I like, I like that. that yeah. mm -hmm. um, you can, wait, while customers are so, so, so <laughs> important, I think what it's important to gain customer traction, it's very important not to get too connected or too focused on one customer, especially if they're paying your bills. And, you know, that can really have a massive knock on effect and put you in a very, very scary position. So you really have to watch and look forward and just be sure of how, how long you have before that money runs out in the bank. And I think it's just keeping an eye on that that's the, the main thing. You always should know what's in your bank account. Was that your darkest hour? Just to go back to actually the darkest the question. hour? Yeah, it was. I, I, I was. We were too dependent on one customer at okay. one point. Best bit? So far? So far. There's so many good bits. There's so many good bits. I think it's just, it's it's from having uh, do you know what? It's it's really nice to know that we create employment for fifteen people. That's just a really nice thing. Is that not also terrifying? No. <laughs> huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just a really nice thing. It's like this this is great. This is a great thing that you've done. Nice. But also it's like um, you know having uh, apps that are included in best of 20, 2015 by Apple. I mean that was a huge achievement for the team. Hmm. But you you share those successes with everybody, and that's how we work. An You're getting the hoodie. They were too. You actually stole my last question <laughs> that I was going to finish off with, so you're going to get the hoodie for that. Yeah. He's not giving it to you yet, though. He looks like he's not going to throw a hoodie. I'm not going to throw the hoodie. I'll, I'll get somebody else. <laughs> Amy? Hiya. Hello. Hello. Stand up and shout. No, no, I could do that. You could wait for the mic. John, John's going with the mic. There you go. Um, Claire, it was a fascinating story. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering, you've come on obviously a fair amount recently, grown up to like 15 employees. What are you now finding uh, are challenges that you haven't faced before as you're scaling? That's a good question. I mean, it's it, there are many, many, many challenges as you go from one stage to the next, and every now and again you feel, oh, leveled up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you, you kind of to grow into a bigger organisation, you have to just. You're not like five people in a room anymore. You have to really kind of go, okay, what, what are the, the processes that we need to embed? And they are kind of things like processes. And you have to sort of go, okay, we're a real company now. Let's put all these things in place and make sure that everybody knows about it. And, and, and that's the way that the, the machine continues to work. I think that, that's, that's the main thing. It's kind of going, okay, 
new set of challenges, more people. How do we make sure that everybody is being looked after to the same extent? Do you expect that will change? Just to follow on, it's a great question, Amy. But do you, do you expect that's going to change this year because you're talking about bringing in an institutional venture partner? So yeah. it's not somebody who's on an advisory board and knows the industry per se. Mm. This is a person coming in because they want 10x out of your company. Yeah. And they are going to, to push you hard on that every month. So do you, do you, how, how are you preparing yourself for that? By being in a good position for that to happen. I mean, I'm well aware that that's how, how things work and I want to be able to deliver that and I want to be able to deliver more than that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but just, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, that's a huge thing, isn't yeah. it, you know? And the possibility that they may disagree with your vision then as well. I know, that's the worst one. <laughs> so, how, how, so what are you doing to prepare yourself for that? I find the right investor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Which I think is amazing advice, right? You're supposed to vet the, the, the investor as much as they vet you. You've got to yeah. do your due diligence. You have to. Yeah. You have to. I mean, it's, you're not there just to get somebody's money. You're, get, you're there to get somebody who can help your company and your vision grow. And they have to be part of your team. They have, they're so important that they're on board with your vision. I think that's the most important thing. Time for one more. This better be a good question because no you, you're not getting a t-shirt for it. But this is for the love of the knowledge. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman here. How do you stay focused in your job? Because you work a lot abroad, traveling into conferences. I do, yeah. Um, well, I have a great team. That helps. Um, I also do a lot of yoga and meditation. That helps. Um, and you know, there's, there are just it's those north stars on all the different aspects of the company that we're working on. Everything is working towards the same thing. We set goals at the start of the year and we review them every quarter that are in line with where the company should be going. So just making sure that we're on track with those things. I think that's that's the way to do it. All right, cool, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call it a day there, folks. Um, Claire, Claire is gonna stay around for <laughs> beer and pizzas. I would love a beer. Yay! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so she's gonna be around. Please come up and say hello to her and ask any questions that you may not have uh, got to during the, during the course of the evening. But I'd like to, I, I found that fascinating. Thank you for your time. You're and uh, can I get a big round of applause, please, for Claire McHugh of Ashton.